beavers are like the ultimate water cowboys. They fence in water with their dams. They wrestle wild trees to the ground, and they ride the mighty river current steeds in search of new lands. Today, we're looking at making beavers part of your water management strategy on agricultural land. Dr. Glennis Hood of the University of Alberta, who specializes in wetland ecology and is a real hands-on scientist, she probably spends more time standing in the mud of beaver ponds and working in her office. She's going to give us an idea of what working with beavers could look like and what the benefits are. But before we get into any of that, I'm going to tell you the tale, no, 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 I'm going to tell you the legend of Geronimo the skydiving beaver. I'm Derek Leahy, and this is Rural Routes to Climate Solutions. Shortly after the Second World War, the Idaho Fish and Game Department had a situation on their hands. They needed to relocate a bunch of beavers to a protected wilderness area because people were moving into the beavers' territory and the state thought it would be best to move the beavers to another location before they flooded somebody out. Plus, even at this time, so we're talking the late 1940s, the state recognized that beavers can play an important role in watershed conservation. The problem was very few roads could get you into this wilderness area, and the roads that existed were really rough. Uh, Trucking the beavers in, it just wasn't gonna be an option. An attempt was made to move the beavers in by mules and horses. This didn't work out so great according to the official report. The horses and mules became really spooked and quarrelsome because of the smelly and sometimes belligerent beavers that were strapped in boxes to their backs. So that meant they had to move on to Plan B. Plan B was to make the beavers airborne. Elmo Heater in a employee of the Fish and Game Department in Idaho got the idea that they could take advantage of all the parachutes that were kicking around after the war and use them to drop beavers in boxes into their new home. The first drop box design didn't really work out. Uh, They decided to use woven willow walls at the ends, the idea being beavers really like willow, it's something they eat, so they'll just chew their way out once the box lands on the ground. Sounded good, but the problem was the beavers figured out pretty quickly that their prison was made out of food and Heater and his team were worried that the beavers might chew through the box well before the box landed on the ground. The next design, and what turned out to be the winning design, was two lidless boxes put together. They're about 30 inches long, 26 inches wide, and 12 inches deep. Ropes were used as hinges and rubber bands made from truck tubes were placed on the bottom of the box and these rubber bands had enough tension in them that they could pop the box open when the lines of the parachute went slack. In other words, as soon as the box hit the ground and the parachute slowly collapsed, the tension in the parachute lines would be gone and the rubber bands could pop open the box and let the usually two bait beavers who are in the box out. Now at this point, Heater and his team had to test the design. Now the first two few tests were done with dummy weights, but eventually they selected an older male beaver that they eventually named Geronimo, and he became the first live animal test. Geronimo made multiple jumps. I actually haven't been able to find out the exact number. The report simply says he was dropped again and again. Now every time Geronimo was dropped, there'd be a handler waiting for him on site to scoop him up so he wouldn't get away. Apparently, Geronimo became so used to this routine, the second he touched down on the ground, saw his handlers outside the box, he just waddled back into the box and sat there. Reports said he eventually became resigned to the fact he was gonna be thrown out of a plane again. But part of me really, really wishes it was because he developed such a love of skydiving, that's why he climbed back into the box and I realize it's very, very, well, slim odds that actually was the case. The tests were being done in meadows and fields where the handlers could simply drive in on a truck, grab Geronimo, bring him back to the airfield. But eventually the day came when Geronimo would take his last flight and make his last jump. But this time it would be in the hinterlands of the Chamberlain Basin, his brand new home. We're gonna pick up where we left off with Geronimo's story at the end of this episode. The reason I wanted to tell you this story is for, well, for two reasons. First of all, I find this hilarious, and it might make me a horrible person, but the thought 
of a beaver snug in a parachute with aviator glasses on falling from the sky. It still makes me laugh right now. The second reason I brought up the story is, well, beavers can be a pain in the ass for agricultural producers. They build dams wherever they want. Sometimes they flood out roads, other infrastructure, or parts of your land that you have in production. Glennis Hood fully recognizes that these beavers or any beavers can be a costly problem. We'll get to that in a moment. I just want to listen to what Glennis had to say uh, at the very beginning of her presentation. She explained what got her first thinking of beavers as water farmers. When I was studying beavers way back in 2002, many of you probably remember the worst drought on record. The worst drought in 137 years of climate data. And that was right in the heart of some of my most critical research on beavers. And I thought, oh man, what's happening? My ponds are drying up. And I started to get a feel for this interface also with beavers and agriculture then too. Because what I was finding was that even though the beaver ponds were going down, and this is a pond in northern part of Elk Island National Park, right adjacent to lots of grazing lands, that beavers were digging these channels and keeping water on the landscape. Every other pond was drying up. The only ponds that had water in them were ones with beavers in them. And what I was also noticing adjacent to the park was that anybody who had cattle were desperately asking their neighboring landowners who had beavers on their landscape if they could put their cattle there. That was the only place they were finding water, number one, but also number two, it was the only place you'd ever find anything that was green. All of those sedges and 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 rushes along the edge and the grasses along the edge of the beaver ponds were the only green edible vegetation for cattle. And so you just see cattle moving around in the area to lands that had beavers on them. Well, that was pretty dramatic. So we, I started to work with my PhD advisor at the time and we started looking at some of the data that we could get a hold of over a 54 year period. And so we looked at the maps from the warden service in Elk Island National Park, and they would map all the active and inactive lodges over time because beavers were reintroduced to Elk Island in 1941 from Banff National Park. They brought seven beavers in. And so they would document exactly where these beavers were. I could get historic air photos going back to 1940, oh, I think it was 1942 at the time. And so I could on-screen digitized using a program called Ge- Geographic Information Systems. I could figure out the areas of these ponds over time. I could figure out where the beaver locations were, whether they were active in red or inactive, abandoned in yellow, and how that changed over time. I looked at climate data and precipitation and max and min temperatures and how much was evaporating, all of that, so that I could figure out whether it was beavers that were driving water on the landscape Or what I really suspected was it was just precipitation and that beavers were just taking advantage of it. That's what both of us, Dr. Suzanne Bailey and I, both thought. We're really fortunate to have two drought events during this time period as well. One in 1950 and one in 2002. The 2002 one being the absolute worst drought on record, 1950 being the fourth worst drought on record. We also had a time period before the beavers were reintroduced where there were absolutely no beavers in Elk Island National Park. So we had a kind of a control period where if there's no beavers there at all, what happens with this climate? And so we thought, okay, this is going to be an easy walk in the park. It was a whole lot of work. And I thought, well, yeah, beavers are going to benefit. What we found actually was just the opposite. Where there was beavers, there was water. And not just a little bit of water. In 1950, which was the fourth driest year on record, they had 47% more precipitation than 2002 drought. There were no beavers in this area that we were studying, and there was less open water. That's the yellow outline there. In 2002, the driest year on record, beavers are well established in the park by that point. The ponds that had beavers in them, there was 61% more open water on the landscape during the worst drought on record than when there were no beavers on the landscape and it was an easier going drought than we had. This is groundbreaking in some ways. And we just sat there and I re-ran the data analysis over and over again. I went back to the air photos and checked how I outlined those ponds and made sure that my areas were 
and it just kept coming up over and over again. It got international attention. And it was one of these things that showed that beavers were actually farming water, if you don't mind the expression. More open water during the worst drought on record than during a drought that had much more precipitation decades earlier. Just take a moment and let that one sink in. So there's definitely something to this. It looks like beavers can help with trapping moisture on your land. And it doesn't end there. Beavers build habitat for other species and thus help biodiversity. If you've listened to our Farming with Biodiversity series, you already know how important biodiversity is for yields, for soil health. And uh, just a really quick side note here. At this point in Glennis's presentation, you start to hear some, how do I say this exactly, non-beaver related noise bleeding into the recording. This presentation is another one from our uh, Organic Alberta 2018 conference vault. And unfortunately, there was a dog show going on at the exact same time as Glennis's presentation. So once in a while, you might hear some barking or some cheering. Glennis actually addressed the barking at one point in her presentation. She said it reminded her of the beaver circus she attended in Russia, leaving me with two nagging questions still. What the hell is a beaver circus and do beavers actually bark? So... I can study the ecology all I want. I could even study the after effects of this as an ecologist and just walk away. But I thought I'd better start putting my money where my mouth is and trying to figure out how to deal with this. Because these ponds are ecologically important in many, many areas. So I've had graduate students and undergraduate students working with me to look at the ecological benefits. And there are many. There are invertebrates that use these ponds more than they use unoccupied ponds or abandoned ponds. There are there's high bio, higher biodiversity in here. We have all sorts of things happening. When it comes to wood frogs, uh, one of my former um, graduate students, Nils Anderson, and um, Dr. Cindy Piskowski and I were looking at wood frog dispersal. And those white lines that you see coming away from the beaver pond are actually channels that beavers like Brownie dug up and extended into the upland areas. They are tremendously important for water, focusing water and for water storage. But they're also really important for dispersal of aquatic animals that spend some of their time in terrestrial habitats. How important? Well, wood frogs use them nine times more often than just regular shoreline. That gives them a survival advantage that you wouldn't believe. They don't have to go through really sharp vegetation and get their sensitive skin cut. They don't get predated on quite as much. They've got security of water until they can get to those upland areas. So we're learning a lot about how beavers are helping ecologically. Another thing that I did was make a lot of bathymetric maps of these ponds. So looking at the depth and mapping the bottoms of these ponds, they're deeper, statistically deeper. They have more convoluted shorelines, which increases biodiversity because your habitat um, availability increases because that interface between water and land is really, really rich in species and diversity. And it increases, it's hard to compete with these dogs, <laughs> increases um, landscape connectivity as well. So critters can move across landscapes way more easily. In winter as well, when these are frozen, I'll just find moose tracks and everything walking up and down these channels. Why would I go through a pile of down um, trees and, and through the brush when I can just walk these channels that are frozen? And so the red dots on this map indicate active beaver lodges. So I, I always do a yearly survey with my students of Miquelon Lake, Lake Provincial Park. And we always say which lodges are active and which log lodges are inactive by year because it switches on and off as we go. So they've got a tremendous role in moving water around, keeping it on the landscape. Those channels actually focus water into the ponds during drought. Remember that first one where I said they were spending so much time digging channels. It's just like farmers who want to drain their field in the spring. You dig a big channel down the center, water focuses in. Once it dries out, you fill it back in again. The only difference is beavers don't. These channels, I'm not that tall, but so I really can feel the depth of these channels. They're over a meter deep. They can be over a meter wide, and the longest one I've measured is 500 meters long. They joined a, several different channels over time. 
on average, they can be, you know, up to 100 to 200 meters long in some areas. And some of them are really short, too, but they're all focusing water onto landscape. One of my um, friends in uh, University of Saskatchewan, Dr. Sherry Westbrook, found that having a beaver pond that sort of stopped water, these impoundments, on your, in an area can increase the groundwater recharge equivalent to a 1 in 500 year drought or, or flood. Your groundwater is just getting absolutely filled up again just by having these impoundments there. So beavers are great at keeping water on the landscape. And I said, 1 in 500, and she goes, that's as far back as our models could go. It was probably even longer than that. So they're doing a lot of work keeping water on. So when I started to calculate volumes, the average volume in these beaver ponds when they were occupied by beavers was 25% higher than ponds that were abandoned by beavers in the same year with the same weather condition. So they're really good at farming water. Great for biodiversity, great for increasing water holding capacity, they sound like a dream animal, right? You don't see chickens or sheep doing anything like that now, do you? But on the other side of this coin, beavers can be a really costly nuisance. And the cost isn't just in the damage they cause. The costs are also in trying to solve beaver problems. Another thing, though, is that by this activity that we call in ecology ecosystem engineering, beavers can also engineer their way into a lot of conflict with humans. And so I'm going to balance this ecology with conflict in this talk today and talk a little bit about this. So prior to being coming a professor in 2012, I was actually with Parks Canada for almost 20 years with the warden service, so as a park warden. And I also worked with beavers then, but in a whole different capacity. Here's one tiny little culvert, maybe about that big, in the middle of that beaver dam. This is a major fire access road along the boundary, east boundary of Elk Island National Park, agricultural land on the other side of it. And I talked to the general works people and I said, so can you estimate or give me a number value for how much it costs to fix this road anytime the beavers are damming it up like this? And they went back to their books, which probably didn't have a whole lot of data in them, but they went back and they said, it's got to be at least $100,000 over the past few years. It's a lot of money. We keep going back to this spot. And I thought, yep, there's conflict. So they've got ecological benefit, but we also have realities of having these ecosystem engineers on our properties. And so one of the ways to deal with beaver problems was to blow up the dam. To blow up uh, the dam, sometimes remove the colony, use a backhoe, all of this is expensive. It's really hard to get your blasting certification and to store explosives after 9-11 was really, really complicated because we used to do avalanche control in Jasper National Park and all of a sudden everything changed with storing dynamite. With this, some of you who've heard me talk before already have seen this, but that's part, and way up there is part of the beaver dam. And I always tell people I was the only one wearing a hard hat that day. And I was the only one standing far enough back to see all this, too. But guess what happens the next morning? Fixed. Not only fixed, it's even better than before. That was a really expensive event. I bet you about three of the guys that were there were on overtime. I wasn't allowed to claim overtime as a warden. But... Came back the next morning, and that thing's just as big, and the flooding's right back again. So that's a traditional way of dealing with beaver management. Also, with the new Alberta wetland policy, draining wetlands has a cost. Uh, not necessarily to Parks Canada, because it's happening within the park, but draining wetlands has a per hectare cost. And farmers have been dinged with it for draining wetlands on their property. I have friends that work in consulting that are always trying to help farmers figure out what to do with these wetlands. This is a 2.5 hectare wetland. Right before this photo was taken, not right before, but the day before this photo was taken, I was at the same pond. It had fresh amphibian eggs in there from frogs. There were beaver, baby beavers likely inside the lodge still that were getting ready to come out. The birds have laid their eggs. The ducks have laid their eggs in their nests. 
And then somebody wanted to practice how to use the dynamite so that they could fix beaver problems. They had a whole course, and they drained this entire pond. 2.5 hectares at the going rate is $45,000 compensation. Now that's a lot of money. And so we're not only draining ponds and there's a financial cost, but an ecological cost as well. Because amphibians are struggling, we have bird populations, especially riparian songbird populations that are declining. I was looking at an updated version of the Alberta Wetland Mitigation Directive, and it's close to $20,000 per hectare for draining a wetland. The idea is the money is supposed to go to creating, monitoring, and administering a brand new wetland to replace the one that you've drained. So if you're a producer, you might be feeling a bit conflicted here. On one side, the little buggers are great for moisture catchment and they're great for biodiversity. On the other side, they're kind of hard to work with. It's not like working cattle or sheep. I'm sure any uh, livestock producers listening right now, they probably have that one animal who's extremely stubborn and consistently does the exact opposite of what you want them to do. Now imagine that animal with the help of some of his friends or her friends and 25 years of hard work could build a 2,700 foot long dam on your land. He can pretty much kiss goodbye that brand new shop you just built yourself. Okay, okay, okay. Beaver dams, they rarely get that big. And the beaver dam I just described is the largest one in the world. It's actually in Wood Buffalo National Park. But seriously, how do we harness beavers' amazing ability to farm water and engineer thriving ecosystems? Two words, pond levelers. So they're really good at farming water. But they're really good at making us pull our hair out, too. I have lost a lot of sleep over beaver-human conflict. My phone rings off the hook all the time. And so this is a trail. It's actually a trail in the southern part of the Cooking Lake Blackfoot Provincial Recreation Area, actually right across from where they were blasting beaver dams in Elk Island National Park, right across the fence. This trail had been closed on and off for over 10 years. It's a very popular equestrian trail. And there are some very, very wealthy equestrians in the area who were very upset about the lack of access to trails, as were the runners and skiers and everybody else. And it's a nightmare for a park. There's also a culvert somewhere in there as well. And so I thought, well, put my money where my mouth is. I better start looking at how to solve some of these human beaver conflicts. If I'm going to rave about the ecological benefits, I can't disregard that they cause millions of dollars of damage across Alberta and beyond. So I thought about it, and I worked on it quite hard, looked at what kind of things I could do, and I was able to change a trail that looked like this into one like that, exactly the same spot. I started this study looking at how do I put in flow devices to stop the flooding. The beavers can stay on the landscape, the water stays on the landscape, the facilities stay on the landscape. Very little maintenance. It's been dry now for almost 10 years. A little bit of tweaking here and there on the, on the leveling device, but more or less, people don't even remember that it used to be chronically flooded and closed. Just to give you an idea, they, almost, they work much like a siphon. We put the pipe through the dam at the location that we want the pond to stay at. Okay, so if we want the water level to be at this level, that's where we put the pipe through the dam. So we break the dam open to that level. Then we put the pipe in, we sink this cage with that end. It has a floor on it so beavers can't dig up and get to that pipe. They can't go on the top. I actually jump on the top after the install to get water to start to pump through that pipe. And it, it, even after Christmas dinners and not a lot of exercise, I still don't break through. And so that's how the idea of this pond leveler. So anytime the water comes above that level in the dam, it starts drawing water. And I've even seen it in really warm winters. I'll go out and check these things, and you can hear water flowing through those. Yeah, well, I build the cage though out of a number 13 hog fencing, uh, galvanized hog fencing from UFA. They know me on a first name basis from UFA. This is just culvert pipe. It's that, I'm gonna say this wrong, HDPE, high density, yeah. Um, high density polyethylene pipe or something like that. 
anyway, they, they, they sell all the stuff. I use hog rings to join up the hog fencing and everything else. It's all, a lot of it's from UFA. The piping I had to get from a plumbing store. And um, that cost a window and a car, but they replaced it, so that's all right. <laughs> I mean, this has just been a fun adventure. So we built the cage out of the hog fencing. We attached that pipe to the cage, and you'll see that there, it was undercut so that it doesn't, it, it, it draws that water into the cage really well. So we join the first length of pipe that's attached to the cage. It's a double-walled pipe. It's about a $300 pipe. But we attach that to the cage, and then we have a single wall pipe that can actually go through the dam quite nicely because it bends. And so in total, we have about 40 feet of pipe. And um, yeah, 40 feet of pipe. The cage is way at the end there. We drop it. The person's standing on the cage now. The rest goes through the dam. And then we protect that end. And I've had some, like I said, that have lasted now since 2011. And they're still working. With what, Some of them have had no maintenance at all. Some have had other ma- uh, required some maintenance. So it's not all 100% success. But it's a high success rate, really high. All right, now we're on to something here. Glennis said the pond levelers require very little maintenance and they rarely have issues with ice in the winter. The single wall piping also helps because the beavers hear the sound of running water and instinctually they start to dam up the area around the pipe. They pretty much help you cement the leveler right into the dam. Glennis also had an important tip before you do anything. So before you you purchase your pond leveler, you got to know what's happening upstream and downstream in the area you want to deal with. You don't want to create a whole new set of problems for yourself just because you didn't do your homework first. Then you should do a cost benefits analysis. Obviously, one drawback to the pond leveler is it's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money. So you need to figure it out if it's worth it for you. Now, here's Glennis going over the financial numbers. When we did the cost-benefit analysis, we did three major measures. One was management costs. With the Cooking Lake Blackfoot Provincial Recreation Area, they gave us all the costs that they had spent on each of the sites that we were putting in pond levelers, up until the time that we installed the pond leveler. And that was a little bit difficult to follow the trail, but they were, they were pretty good about being able to keep track of their costs. In the county, it was a little bit harder because they were just responding to emergency calls all the time, and so documenting it wasn't as um, tight as it was with Alberta Parks, but we keep track of the management costs for traditional approaches, backhoes, explosives and the like. Um, we looked at, for the Cooking Lake Blackfoot, a willingness to pay model where how much would you value this trail if you could use it without any flooding by beavers. And that gives us some sort of way to value the facility. And the... Um, Beaver County, we looked at wetland valuation. So what, um, what, size, what hectare area of wetland would be lost every time they drain these ponds if they were to be charged for some sort of compensation value? They weren't, but what if they were? And then we kept track right down to the penny of our installation costs, right down to the half kilometer to drive to the site. We kept track of everything. And so that gave us some input into a cost-benefit analysis. So these were the results. And they're both over a three-year period, and you'll notice a difference in the numbers. And I'll walk through the numbers real quick. One of the biggest differences is because of the management costs and the tracking of them was much tighter with Alberta Parks than it was with Beaver County. And so I think the management costs for traditional management in Beaver County were really underestimated because they just didn't have a lot of the data. This is with the willingness to pay costs, so it's really you know, more of a theoretical value, the $2 million, $2.7 million savings over three years for those 13 sites. That's if you were to do traditional management versus the use of these pond levelers. But we can get to a dollar per dollar value if we just look at a sensitivity analysis and take out that willingness to pay value. It's still over an $81,000 savings to Alberta Parks over that three years. I know having worked for parks, how, how much they get cut all the time in budget cuts, so that's a big savings. In Beaver County, if we put in the wetland valuation, it was over $384,000 that they would have saved at those sites. Okay, let's take out that wetland valuation. 
there's still over a $64,000 savings just by having those pond levelers in without having to go back repeatedly to maintain those problem sites. And these were, they gave us the worst of the worst sites. Because we would say to them, which sites do you want us to deal with first? And they knew which sites they wanted dealt with because they were the ones they were going back sometimes daily to deal with. And so there's this benefit of having these pond levelers in and they're cost effective. So we've done a lot of work in um, the Cooking Lake Blackfoot Provincial Recreation Area, Beaver County, uh, um, and Camrose, as I've said, put in about 30 of these, and a lot of them are working really well. I've had problems with probably two of them out of the 30 that have kind of caused me a little bit of grief, and that's usually when there's really narrow channels involved, and the beavers just keep trying to build repeated dams down these channels. So the way I solved that was to make a pipe that extended all the way the length of the channel into the pond and put caging around it. Always out thinking these things. That's a huge cost saving. And fair enough, those numbers were more or less meant for a county, but Glennis has installed pond levelers on farms too. And you can do the math yourself to determine if it's worth it for you and your land. You could probably do it by figuring out how much your crop is worth and then subtracting it by the cost of installing a leveler. Plus, assuming that you want to deal with this problem on your land, you'll probably have to factor in the cost of draining the wetland in the first place. And don't forget those ecosystem services that a beaver pond provides because those have a monetary value too. Glenna said pond levelers are a good tool, but by no means are they the only tool that's out there. A canine urine is apparently more effective than wolf urine. What I mean by that is by spreading canine urine in the area that the dam is, you might be able to deter the beavers and frighten them away. There's hunting, there's trapping, live trapping, not so much. Glennis also said she's about 90% sure you could use a smartphone connected by Bluetooth to a wireless speaker and have that speaker and the phone playing the sounds of running water to try and lure beavers to a less problematic area. She actually did try this once and she said it was working. The only reason it didn't work out in the end was because a friend started texting her all of a sudden and the pinging noise really weirded the beavers out and they left. For many producers, not draining wetlands and actually working with beavers is going to be quite a mental shift. Uh, draining wetlands is a practice that's been ingrained in Alberta agriculture for quite some time now. If you look at why wetland drainage is just such a habit. It's not a habit. People were punished for not draining wetlands and making a certain percentage of their agricultural land arable in the early land tenure systems in Western Canada. We have the Northwest Irrigation Act. We have all sorts of... You could lose your property if you didn't expand your agricultural... Um, use of that land by a certain percentage every year. So draining wetlands was what you would do. You would cut down forests, you'd do all that, or else you would be punished by not doing that and possibly have your land given to somebody else in historic context of developing Canada's um, agricultural west, let's say. So there are moves afoot to try to find a compensation program that would actually pay farmers and agri our agriculturalists to keep wetlands on their property. The legislation itself, though, is also con contradictory because you can't drain a wetland under the Water Act. Beavers are an, uh, wildlife under the Wildlife Act. They're pests under the agriculture. And if you allow your property to um, flood another person's property, then you have to drain that wetland and you don't get charged for draining beaver ponds, but you get charge for draining other wetlands, but you see how the legislation itself is problematic. And so I think the government now, they've heard me speak enough, that they're starting to try to figure this stuff out, but they need to hear from people who are being affected by this. Okay, back to our buddy Geronimo. When the day finally came for the beavers to be permanently moved to the new home, Geronimo was on the very first plane. According to the report, Geronimo was actually reluctant to get out of the box when he hit the ground. He just kind of sat there. 
Even the three younger female beavers that had been dropped in the area with him who were scurrying about were not a good enough reason for Geronimo to get out of the box initially. Maybe Geronimo knew this was his last flight and he was being kind of nostalgic. Or maybe he just knew the routine so well he was just waiting for his handler to scoop him up and throw him out of a plane again. Nonetheless, he did eventually get out of the box and create a thriving beaver colony in the area. But in my mind, I like to pretend that the story, or the end of the story, goes like this. Geronimo climbs out of the box and climbs out into freedom. Gets down on the ground and he looks up in the sky. A tear rolls down his chubby little beaver cheek as he wonders, will he ever feel the wind through his fur like that again? By the way, uh, they recently found the film footage of Idaho's parachuting beavers. Uh, you can actually watch it on YouTube. Thank you to Dr. Glennis Hood of the University of Alberta for your presentation at the Organic Alberta Conference in 2018. Uh, we wouldn't have a podcast episode without your beavers and water management presentation you made last winter. Thank you as well to the Alberta Real Estate Foundation for providing financial support for the podcast. Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is a central Alberta-based project empowering rural Albertans with climate solutions. Along with this podcast, we run workshops and farm field days. Our next workshop will be on February 2nd, and it's all about how to create your very own farmers cooperative. This will take place at our home base, which is the Stetler Learning Center. For more information about the workshop and Rural Roots to Climate Solution, just go to the website. It's www.rr2, that is a two as in a numeric two, cs.ca four amazing people make up the backbone make up the advisory committee of rural roots of climate solutions and their names are brenda barrett dana penrice mark fox and kim cornish today's episode was recorded at pop-up podcasting in ottawa why ottawa i'm on the uh, last leg of my trip visiting family and friends out east kieran mountain of mountain media and red deer took care of the editing for this episode Happy farming wherever you are in Alberta. I hope everyone found a really fun and great way to bring in the new year. And remember, what's good for the farm is usually good for the climate.